Good morning, students. Now we will talk about the fertilization and about the cleavage. And at the end of this lecture, I will also explain you about the homeobox genes. There you see an oocyte, an ovum, which is just in, uh, fertilized by a sperm cell. And here you see a two cell stage. So we will explain today how this may happen. Uh, this picture shows you a schematic uh, series of happenings within the first three weeks. Uh, there you see the ovary. We know that from the ovary, the, uh, the ovum is released in the middle of the cycle. It gets into the uterine tube. Then it, if it gets uh, fertilized, then it will start its uh, mitotic divisions. And so we get the morula. Morula consists of many cells still surrounded by the zona pellucida. And at the end of the first week, uh, this morula uh, will turn into a blastocyst and the blastocyst will hatch and will be released from its covering. So we will get today until the end of the first week. <coughs> but first we will have to discuss a little bit about the background. Uh, the uterus is under the influence of estrogens and progesterones. Estrogen is produced by the growing follicle in the ovary and the progesterone is produced uh, by the yellow body, corpus luteum. Uh, the ovum uh, is released due to an increase in the H LH levels. LH is released from the pituitary and the follicular growth is regulated by the FSH, follicular stimulating hormone. Here you see the abbreviations. FSH stands for follicular stimulating hormone. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. You have to know these abbreviations. So these two hormones with a common name called the gonadotrope hormones, these are released from the anterior lobe of the pituitary. But the pituitary is regulated uh, by hypothalamic hormones. These hypothalamic hormones are uh, produced by nerve cells with long axons. They get to the bottom of the brain uh, to the hypothalamus. There they are released to capillary uh, loops and the capillary is gathered to a vein and re it, they are recapillarized in the anterior lobe of the pituitary. And through this, with a relatively high concentration, they reach uh, these gonadotrope uh, uh, hormone producing cells. At all levels, there are feedback mechanisms which regulate this process. Now, at the end of this story of this precise regulation, uh, in the fertile period of a woman, there is the uh, menstrual cycle. Traditionally, the menstrual cycle uh, is, uh, as we describe it, we start it with the menstruation, although that's truly the end of the story. But because the first day of the menstruation is something that you can really detect well, that's why the conventional descriptions are always starting the cycle with the period of the menstruation. This is about a four-day period at the beginning of the cycle. Then on the 14th day, the ovulation happens, and after an other 14 days, if the uh, cycle is regular, 28 day long, uh, then again, the menstruation will come. This is truly really a cycle, so kind of like a circle, but for easier understanding, we straighten this line. So there you have then the first period, which starts with the menstruation. In the middle, there is the ovulation, and thereafter uh, comes the second phase of the cycle, uh, when in the, in the ovary, the corpus luteum is working producing the progesterone, and there are special changes in the uterine mucosa to prepare it to accept the fertilized ovum. Now, the, uh, the growth of the uh, follicle that happens in the ovary. As we already stated in the previous lectures, uh, the primary uh, oocyte that is sitting in a primordial follicle uh, from the middle of the pregnancy, so we form the five month old uh, fetus age until, for some reason, it starts to go on with this uh, uh, growth and within the follicle, it will do its uh, ripening. Uh, we get the primary follicle, uh, the secondary follicle, preantral follicle, early antral follicle, late antral follicle, and at the end, we get to the Graafian follicle, which may then ovulate. Uh, this process, until the antral follicles that last very, for a very long time. It's about six months, and it is not influenced by the hormones. Only the last 20-day period, 
the last 20 day period is influenced by these uh, pituitary hormones. And uh, from the many follicles uh, which start their growth in a certain period, after six months, there are about 10, 15, maximum 20 uh, uh, follicles there which can enter this last 20 day period of the cycle. If we see the numbers, how, what happens through these six to seven months, then uh, the primordial follicle is about 30 micrometers big. The, uh, they grow for about four months till they reach the diameter of 120 micrometer. Then it takes another two months till they reach the one millimeter size. And only in the last 20 days, they grow fast and they reach the full size of the graphene follicle, which is about 15 to 20 millimeters. So that is about the size of a cherry. And as you see, even if this last 20 days is longer than just this first phase of the cycle, so be careful because many books, even today, they describe this follicular growth as a two week long uh, period. So it lasts very long. And even this last 20 days, when we have, when we uh, come from the antral uh, follicle to the uh, graphene follicle, that, that even is longer than the two weeks. How can you imagine this? that uh, if you are a woman and you have uh, primordial follicles in your ovary, then in this month in March, about 100 of these primordial follicles start their growth randomly within the month. As they grow, many of them will get uh, atrotized, so they die off, and always less and less are yet growing. And somewhere in September, there comes this last 20 day period, and then in September, there will be middle of September, let's say there will be the ovulation. One of those about 100 uh, primordial follicles which started their growth now in March, one of them will ovulate in September. But since this happens continuously, in every month there will be an ovulation. So you have always hundreds of follicles which are under growth at different stages. But let's return to this problem. So we have now the ovulation, the oocyte is released from the follicle. The rest of the follicle remains in the ovary and turns into the yellow body. The yellow body produces the progesterone. It produces at a relatively high level for about 10 days or so. And then it starts to decrease the function of the yellow body. Uh, the progesterone uh, secretion ceases. And due to this, then the uterine mucosa will be discarded. Uh, but if there is a fertilization, so the oocyte is released, gets into the uterine tube, and in the female genital system, there are also sperm cells. Then the, uh, the fertilization may happen there where the star is. This is the so-called ampulla of the fallopian tube. Uh, the, how do the, uh, the sperm cells get into the vaginal uh, vagina, into the genital uh, tract? Uh, Due, due to the ejaculation, that's about a few milliliters, right? And in this, optimally, there should be two to 300 million spermatozoa. Nowadays, it's somewhat less, not only in humans, but also in the Everglades uh, alligators in Florida. So this is uh, probably due to the pollution that we have around us in our surrounding. So, but even then, at least, 30 to 100 million uh, spermatozoa are needed, which start their journey, their trip up in the uh, genital tract. Many of them are lost uh, due to this uh, uh, zigzag uh, movement and to, they turn into the wrong direction. And about three to 500 reach the site of the fertilization. Well, only one of these will fertilize the egg cells. Uh, it's the speed as they travel, it's about one to three millimeters per minute, and it takes a variable uh, time, a few hours till they get to the site of the fertilization. Uh, they may retain their capacity to fertilize for about one day. And please take care because these few milliliters don't mix it up with uh, the volume of a mug which is about two to 300 milliliters. So that's a mug of tea or milk or coffee. Okay, what terms do you have to know yet? You have to know that uh, this uh, ejaculate uh, that contains the semen, also known as seminal fluid, the Latin word is sperma. And uh, this contains uh, many 
substances which are secreted by the male uh, genital glands and tract, and they also contain the spermatozoa, the sperm cells with another term. The spermatozoa give only 5% of the seminal fluid. So this is how the ovary looks like with a laparoscopic picture. There you see the ovary. There the graphene follicle is bulging forward, and as it pushes against the surface of the ovary, there a thin uh, spot will appear, that is called a stigma. Uh, this is here the uterine tube, and here are the end uh, uh, fringes of the, uh, of the uterine tube, those we call the fimbriae. Uh, this is here an ovulated oocyte. It takes yet the cumulus oophorus cells along uh, with it. Those will, yet, uh, those will then later disappear. And just to compare uh, the sizes, so the granulosa cells are the average size of cells, and here you see a sperm cell that's much uh, smaller. When uh, uh, the ovulation happens, then a secondary oocyte will be released uh, from the ovary with the cumulus ophorus, and only after the fertilization it will finish its second meiotic division. Now, from the other direction, there are the sperm cells coming. Uh, the sperm cells uh, have difficulties to get through the cervix at any time point in the cycle because there is a thick mucus except for the uh, ovulation period, because in the ovulation period, uh, the cervix gets a little bit dilated. These uh, the threads, uh, these uh, mucus threads, these are uh, thinner and they are clearer. And uh, the pH is also optimal uh, for passing uh, of the spermatozoa, so they can pass through the cervix. Many of them are last during the IV, also in the cervical glands, as you see here. Now, to summarize a little bit and combine now our present knowledge with, the, with what we discussed in the previous uh, lecture when we told about the number of chromosomes. Uh, so this uh, follicle, starting with the primordial follicle, and then when it also starts to develop, contains a primary oocyte. So this period for, for the primary oocyte that lasts for a very long time from the fifth fetal month, at least until the first ovulation, let's say at age 14, or it may, uh, may uh, continue at age 20, 30, 40, and usually it ceases around age 45. So the developing follicle contains a primary oocyte. This has 46 chromosomes, each with two chromatids. So with the newer description, we write it, uh, uh, we describe it with these letters, that 46, that's the number of human uh, somatic cell uh, chromosomes, 2n, that means that this is a diploid cell, and 4c, that means the, uh, that uh, the chromosomes have two chromatids and the amount of DNA is 4c. So this uh, first meiotic division is arrested in the prophase 1, uh, as I told you, and the nucleus in this stage is called the germinal vesicle. So this is called here the germinal vesicle. The name is very, not very logical because this is not a vesicle, this is a nucleus, but this term is used nowadays in the in vitro fertilization. And as the primary oocyte resumes the first meiotic division shortly before the ovulation, so only sh very shortly before the ovulation it will resume it, then the nuclear membrane will disappear Right? That's the germinal vesicle breakdown. It has also an abbreviation. This is an important point because that's the sign of that, that this cell uh, go, will go through the second meiotic division. It's important, again, in in vitro fertilization. So after the, uh, the cell completed uh, the first meiotic division, then the cumulus ophorus will contain a secondary oocyte. This secondary oocyte has 23 chromosomes. This is already a haploid cell. Two chromatids each. So we describe it by the number 23. That's the haploid number of chromosomes in human cells. N stands also for being a haploid cell. And the 2C, that is the, uh, the uh, amount of DNA. The secondary oocyte starts the second meiotic division, but it is halted again in the metaphase. Uh, so with the ovulation, the secondary oocyte is released, and the cell division will resume only after penetration of a sperm cell, and the, uh, uh, the uh, fertilization happens in the fallopian tube. 
the result of the second meiotic division is the haploid ovum, and it's already fertilized, 23 chromosomes, haploid cell, and one chromatid in each. So now let's discuss the process of the fertilization. So as the sperm cells get into the female genital tract, they have to go through an activation process, uh, and this is called the capacitation. Through this, from the surface of the sperm cells, glycoprotein and protein coat is removed, and uh, with this, they are able to pass through the corona radiata cells. This picture doesn't show you the corona radiata cells, but please remember that the corona radiata cells were the innermost layer of the granulosa cells attached to the zona pellucida. They had processes uh, which uh, pierced, pierced through the zona pellucida, and they, they connected to the surface of the uh, processes of the uh, oocyte. Through these gap junctions, the oocyte uh, is fed. So then these uh, uh, capacitated sperm cells, they pass through the corona radiata. Uh, then comes the so-called acrosome reaction. What the acrosome is that we discussed with the formation of the sperm cell, right? Enzymes are included, mostly the acrosine. Uh, the membrane over the head of the sperm cell will uh, fall apart and disappears, and this acrosome is exposed. We have a ring of membrane here around the, the head of the sperm cell, and uh, as this acrosome reaction happened, with this, the spermatozoa, they will be able uh, to, to pierce through the zona pellucida. There are also species-specific spe uh, receptors on the surface of the zona pellucida, so a, a sperm cell for, from a foreign species, species cannot penetrate into the oocyte. Here you see as it falls apart. Then this ring of the cell membrane fuses with the surface of the oocyte, which is uh, covered with the membrana vitalina. The membrana vitalina, that's the cell membrane of the oocyte, so it fuses, kind of like connects to it, and the head and the fibrous structures of the tail enter the oocyte. In the head, of course, there is also the nucleus with the genetic material. This will induce the so-called cortical and zona reaction. From these cortical granules, substances are released, which kind of shrink the membrana vitalina. With this here, a gap will appear. This is the perivital line uh, space here. So this will prevent uh, the uh, polyspermia. No more sperm cells are allowed to enter the oocyte. Also, uh, where the, uh, the sperm cell penetrated, as you see it here, this red territory symbolizes that uh, there is a depolarization, a calcium wave, and with this, the second meiotic division, due to this depolarization, the second meiotic division will uh, resume. There you see the uh, spindle, division spindle, of the second meiotic uh, division. So now our oocyte is fertilized, and uh, the, the Besides the DNA, what is brought by the sperm cell, the sperm cell also brings the centriole and essential enzymes. The mitochondria, even if they get into the cytoplasm of the oocyte, they will be broken down because only the maternal mitochondria uh, will be carried on uh, by this uh, uh, cell. With the fertilization, the metabolic activation starts transcription of the preformed uh, uh, RNAs, and with this, the embryogenesis will start. Right, so this is the time point. Uh, stop, uh, the second meiotic division stopped. The, uh, the sperm cell penetrates, and then the second meiotic division is finished. The definitive oocyte, or ovum, is now ready. A second polar body is extruded. The first polar body will either, either divide or not. And from the material of the uh, maternal 23 chromosomes and from the material of the paternal 23 chromosomes, the so-called pronuclei, male and female pronucleus, uh, will form. The pronuclei will not fuse with each other, so we don't have one single cell which contains the final composition of the DNA characteristic for the offspring. But these pronuclei will duplicate their DNA separately, 
and then, then they form a common mitotic spindle, twice 23 chromosomes, they form a common mitotic spindle, each with uh, the 23 chromosomes, twice 23 chromosomes, each with two chromatids, and then the first division will happen, first mitotic division will happen, and then we get to the two cell stage. So actually only in this two cell stage we have the final DNA uh, type of the offspring in these cells. All books summarize the main results of the fertilization by these three points, and this is something basic, what you have to know, that the diploid chromosome number is restored, uh, the sex is determined because the uh, sperm cell will carry either an X or a Y chromosome, a sex chromosome, and the cleavage, that means a series of mitotic divisions, uh, will start, so the initiation of the cleavage. Here you see uh, fertilized oocytes, so that's here the oocyte. We have uh, the pronuclei here. It's told that the male uh, pronucleus is uh, somewhat larger. Probably it's so. On the surface there you have the zona pellucida. You see the zona pellucida is quite a thick layer here. Here also you have an axel with two pronuclei. Again, the axel here with two pronuclei and it's told that the male pronucleus is bigger, the female is smaller. Again, you see here the thick zona pellucida. You see many sperm cells which are stuck into the uh, zona uh, pellucida, but this cell is ready to do the first mitotic division. And this is just a nice picture about spermatozoa after the acrosome reaction. So when the acrosome is exposed on the, on the tip of the sperm cell head. Okay, where are we now at this time point? We are in the uterine tube. So the fertilization happens in the ampulla and it takes about 30 hours till we get to the two cell stage. And then the divisions uh, will go on. So now we will follow this process until the uh, blastocyst stage. This is called the cleavage. These initial mitotic divisions are the cleavage. As I told you already, the two cell stage is, re is reached uh, within about 30 hours and four cell stage 40 hours after the fertilization. These cells at this uh, time point, these are, uh, these are like little balls uh, next to each other and they are called the blastomeres. These are the blastomeres. And these blastomeres are well detectable until the 8 cell stage. And at the 8 cell stage, there uh, something happens. The cells get connected to each other. That is called, that process is called the compaction. Uh, the cell adhesion molecules like ecatherin play, play a role in this. And from here on, from the time point of compaction, from this 8 cell stage, the cells will not divide already at the same speed. Uh, if they don't divide at the same speed, uh, then some of them will be larger, some of them will be sp smaller. Right? The aim of this whole cleavage is to get down to the normal cell size and have a large amount of cells. We know that the ovum that had a lot of cytoplasm and it's much larger than a regular cell, so that reserve cytoplasm allows a big series of uh, divisions. And a kind of like a polarization starts here already after the 8 cell stage, uh, like you must have learned with the epithelial cells, that epithelial cells are polarized. They have an apical surface and a basolateral surface. So these are now in this stage kind of like epithelial cells. Uh, when they divide, uh, they may do the radial cleavage, that gives two polarized cells. Or they may do the tangential cleavage and that gives a polarized and a non-polarized cells. These non-polarized cells, these will be in the inner uh, territory of this morula, and this is called then the inner cell mass. This uh, early stage, when we have a few cells, this also allows that uh, uh, during the in vitro fertilization, uh, genetic examinations uh, may be done. This is called PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This may be important if the parents carry a gene which, is, uh, which can result in a malformation which is not compatible uh, with life. So on the third day, we have 12 to 16 cells. Some of them are in contact with the, with the inner surface of the zona pellucida, some of them not. So which are not, these are the inner cells. These will give cells to form the embryo. 
the outer cell mass that will give the trophoblast, which will then later contribute to the placenta. On the fourth day, we have the so-called late morula. What do we have here? We have a ball of cells. There are lots of cell borders, so the diffusion is always more difficult and difficult uh, to get into the depth of this structure and to, uh, to provide nutrition. So as always, uh, what happens in this case? Water, fluid, uh, nutrition, uh, rich fluid will sneak into the inside of this uh, late morula. Fluid will penetrate and we get then the blastocyst. The blastocyst forms on the fifth, sixth day and it contains, it has the polar trophoblasts on the external surface here. Then we have the embryoblasts from the inner cell mass. We have the blastocyst cavity and we have the mural trophoblast. The blastocyst cavity is not empty. It has a kind of like an interstitial fluid which is rich in nutrients. And all this is covered around yet with the zona pellucida. This is very important. So where are we now? That from the morula, we have now two kinds of cells, trophoblasts and embryoblasts. Please take care that you don't mix the shape, this, this form, the blastocyst, with the graphene follicle. There are totally different things. The blastocyst is much smaller, right? It's around 200, 300 micrometers. Uh, it is in the uterus and it's formed from this cell, which was originally in the ovary of the mother, embedded into the follicle, at the end into the graphene follicle. So this is a graphically a similarly looking structure, but they are completely different things. So please take care, how do you distinguish the graphene follicle? Here you have maternal cells, gr uh, granulosa cells around it, cumulus ovoporus, in the cumulus ovoporus. Before the ovulation, you have the secondary oocyte. If it's fertilized, then it will do its second meiotic division and it will form the blastocyst. Now, what happens next? It's the hatching. We use the same word like, uh, with, uh, like with eggs of birds. And it's, it's really like uh, hatching from an egg. What happens here? That the cells of the blastocyst, the surface cells, the trophoblast cells, produce uh, proteases. These will digest, loosen the, uh, the zona pellucida at a point, and the, um, uh, the blastocyst will escape through this little opening and it will hatch. And this hatching is essential for allowing the implantation. Without hatching, there may be no implantation. Uh, these are stages before uh, the hatching. There you see the Inner cell mass, trophoblast cells, zona pellucida. Inner cell mass, trophoblast cells, zona pellucida. And this is a picture which shows you the blastocyst when it does the hatching. Nowadays, the in vitro fertilization is a quite common process for, for couples who cannot have children through the natural way, or they have kind of like a genetic problem, which uh, makes it a big risk to, to have the traditional way of, of uh, getting pregnant. And on this series of pictures, you see this ICSI, the intracellular sperm injection. Right? Here you see a, a pipette with which the zona pellucida of the oocyte is held, so that, that with that they fix the oocyte. And that's a needle. Here you have the sperm cell in it. And with the needle, with this needle, with the sperm cell in it, the biologist will pierce the zona pellucida and the uh, membrana vitellina, you see that it must be quite hard because it doesn't allow itself to be pierced that easily. And then they push the sperm cell into the, into the uh, oocyte. In this case, with this technique, the intracellular sperm injection, the biologist will pick uh, the sperm cell which will fertilize. Uh, for a period, uh, so first, uh, through you, uh, when the in vitro fertilization was done, then the oocytes were mixed with a lot of sperm cells. So nature chose the right one. Then came this, uh, this intracellular sperm injection technique. And nowadays they start to return back again to this natural, natural in vitro uh, fertilization that they let more uh, sperm cells uh, approach the oocyte and the one which is the uh, luckiest and fastest will be able to fertilize the oocyte. So the years will decide which method is better. 
uh, here you see two links. Now I will show you these short videos. Uh, this website, this embryology.ch, is a very good website, so you can look after things. They are very good animations, drawings, so I advise you to look into it, especially if you don't understand something. So here you see a hatching blastocyst. Uh, you see that here an opening will appear, and with a pulsating movement, the blastocyst will sneak out from the zona pellucida. Of course, this is only detectable in, uh, due, uh, in in vitro conditions. And in the next uh, small uh, movie, you will see the happening from the two cell stage. Right? So here is the two cell stage. You see as the cells divide and pop, now it's four cell stage. There is the polocyte. It again pops and we will get the eight cell stage. It starts to move a little bit and then the cells pop apart. Now you get yet balls, but we will see here the compaction. And from here on this mass, this doesn't contain the same size of cells. You see that it's so uneven because not all cells divide at the same speed. And then at one time point, in, within the morula, the fluid uh, will appear. Right? So that, that's the cavity of the blastocyst. Here, here you have the cavity of the blastocyst forming. And then the surface will be uh, pierced, digested through the proteases, and with the pulsating movement, the blastocyst will sneak out from the zona pellucida, and like an eggshell, the zona pellucida is left behind. And now this structure, this blastocyst, this hedged blastocyst, is ready for implantation. Implantation will be the topic of our next lecture. But now yet, you uh, will hear about the homeobox genes. I know that homeobox genes are not uh, a very much liked topic in the embryology. Uh, they seem to be very complicated. They are also quite complicated, but I will try to give you a, a very simple explanation that you can understand the essence of it. We will not require you more than the essential, essential information about the homeobox genes, uh, maybe in biology or later in genetics, or if you, that will be your profession, then you will know much more about this. So homeobox genes, right? Homeobox genes are plenty, right? They give 0.1% of the genome and they are very conservative regulator genes. The common feature of all homeobox genes is uh, that they contain a 180 base pair sequence that is called the homeobox. Uh, and these genes, the entire genes, are very similar in uh, between different species. They are very much conserved from the Drosophila up to humans. Of course, genes, they code proteins. The homeobox will code a, a segment of this protein, which is called the homeodomain protein segment. And because this was here 180 base pairs, the uh, length of this shorter part of this uh, uh, protein will be 60 amino acids. And here you have even a greater similarity between species because you know that uh, uh, one amino acid has more triplets which can code it. And if the mutation uh, happens so that it ended up with the same amino acid, then that will also explain why we have a greater similarity between the proteins than between the genes. Now this homeodomain protein segment, this has a helix turn helix uh, conformation. And with this, it will clip connect onto the DNA, like this old type clothes pin. That was a uh, comparison in one article what I read. Uh, and this molecular clothes pin switches on or off a gene. So this, with this, they can start a process which is specific already for that, uh, that uh, creature. Uh, this kind of like these switches, we could, we could call these homeobox genes, these homo, uh, uh, domain, uh, homobox genes coded transcription factors also uh, switches. These, these function only to, uh, as to start or stop a process. And they have two groups. This is one basic thing, but in most groups it's not, in most books it's not clearly explained. These uh, two groups, one group is the group which, if it's properly called, then it's called Hox genes. This is a small group of all homeobox genes, uh, and these are the most important Hox uh, genes, which determine uh, homeobox genes, uh, which determine body axis. So all 
hox genes are homeobox genes, but not all homeobox genes belong to this smaller hox group. So these are very important to determine body axis. And other members of this homeobox gene family, they have also very important functions. Many times they, uh, they function in cascades, and they have uh, organ, tissue, and uh, cell-specific effects, and they may have a different effect in one region of the body uh, at one time point and a completely different effect in an other at another time point in another region of the body. They may act also parallelly and regulate different processes in different territories of the body. Uh, because these examinations were carried out in uh, Drosophila, uh, then the abbreviations, these letter codes for these genes, come from the body parts from, from, from the drosophila. Of course, this you won't, will not have to know. And many times, the last letter of these uh, names are, is an, a letter X. This is only, for example, just to give you an impression that we have plenty of these homeobox genes. These are all here homeobox genes. And many times, they come in so-called families, like the TGIF superfamily. Uh, it has many members. These are kind of similar to each other, but they have different effects. Uh, this smaller group of homeobox genes, which is important for determining the body pattern, those were discussed in, uh, this, uh, discovered in 1984 in the Drosophila, in the fruit fly. Uh, there they discovered two groups of, of uh, genes, uh, altogether eight. They were grouped in uh, two sequences. And at that time, they weren't yet marked with numbers, but with the uh, letter abbreviations of the body parts of the drosophila. And scientists discovered that if they doubled uh, uh, the, the gene uh, what was uh, uh, responsible for growing the wings of the drosophila, then the drosophila didn't have one pair of wings, but had two or three pairs of wings, depending how much they doubled it. So they discovered that these are very important genes for the anteroposterior uh, body sequence. And with further examinations, it was also discovered that in invertebrates, there is a maximum of 13 Hox genes. And from this maximum of 13 Hox genes, variable genes may be chosen one, by one group of creatures. So not the same number and not the same ones. Right? That, that you could make many variations from this, but they suppose that they must have been one creature which had all, the, all 13 uh, genes, because when the vertebrate animals came, nature didn't create more hox genes. The ones which already existed were very uh, well-functioning, reliable genes, have been ever since the last uh, few million years. So in vertebrates, uh, in vertebrates, they were made copies of this series on different chromosomes, not of all of them randomly chosen from this maximum 13. In vertebrates, there are three to eight copies. We call them clusters on a chromosomes. And it's typical for this series, and in, in general for Hox genes, that they sit next to each other in the genome. So they make series, uh, a series next, uh, sitting close to each other. And when the mammal, mammalians came, it turned out that all mammalians have four series, A, B, C, D, call we, uh, we call them today, uh, four series of Hox genes, and uh, altogether 39 Hox genes. So the maximum could have been four times 13, right? That would be 52. But we don't have all 13 in this series. In the A, we have 11, B, 10, C, 9, and the D, also 9. Altogether, we have 39 uh, of these uh, genes. And these are uh, very important for defining the body pattern along the anteroposterior axis. And uh, it's the same mechanism in all creatures, but still ensures the big uh, diversity through that, that if they switch, what they switch on, that is different from creature to creature. So I used to have a, a stupid and funny example for that, that in uh, elephants have uh, noses, they have their trunks, humans have their noses, that's not a trunk. Uh, but the gene which switches on that lets go the nose, that's the same in elephant and human, but they still behind this switch gene, there are different processes in the two uh, creatures. Okay. 
because these are copies, uh, then the same genes or very similar genes are found uh, sometimes in all four series, and this we call the parallel group. This is the parallel group of genes. Uh, these are just kind of like maps or patterns that how these genes they code for the Drosophila embryo and how they code for the, uh, the uh, mammalian embryo, in this case the mouse embryo. You see that here in the head region, in the brain region, there are no Hox genes. They stop here at, at this level, and here there will be other regulator genes. Always the lower number that codes something which is closer to the uh, head, so it's a more apical and more distally, there are the larger numbers. This is valid also for the limbs, closer to the shoulder girdle, you have lower numbers, and at the tip of your arm, uh, where you have your fingers, you have the highest numbers, that is the 13. I will show you example for that soon. Uh, because these, uh, uh, these genes are so very important, there are very few known uh, developmental malformations. With this, as the years pass, uh, in the last uh, 30 years, there are more and more discovered, but they are extremely rare. Here I show you two examples. There are a few more, but I will not show you more. One uh, of the best known is the so-called hand-foot genital syndrome, which was first discovered in a Michigan family. In this case, the thumbs and the toes are uh, shorter and the skeleton of the hand, uh, the bony skeleton and feet, that may be also uh, disturbed in development. Women, they have uterine abnormalities uh, and sterility. Men's, men, they have also uh, problems with the genitalia. They may have hypospadias uh, or some genital tract uh, problems. And in both cases, bladder sphincter problems may appear. The DNA ex examination showed that the mutation is present in the HOX-A13 uh, gene. Uh, and or another, uh, other uh, HOX problem, which affects also a 13th uh, gene in the D-series, that's the syn polydactyly. Uh, syndactyly or polydactyly, or the both combined, they may have a very, very variable background, but sometimes it's caused by the variation uh, by the mutation of this D13 gene. And in this case, the fingers are kind of like so deformed. And you see that here there are three, six fingers, but three of them are grown together, grown together and they are kind of like uh, deformed. There were also uh, some uh, experiments made and uh, in the, in the uh, they were made in mice, so not human, of course. The bones which are depicted here, these, these show the human bones, but the experiment was carried out in mice. So uh, you see here that for the shoulder girdle, the D9 gene is responsible for the humerus, the D10, for the forearm, then the D11, carpal bones, D12, and the rays of the fingers, uh, the 13th, uh, D13 is responsible. If in the mouse, for example, uh, the gene for the humerus, that is the D10, uh, is knocked out, knocked out, then the forearm bones will directly connect to the shoulder girdle. And uh, uh, the, these genes, they have to uh, get expressed through the entire growth of the limb. Of course, if someone has a developmental malformation in the limb, that has, can, may have also variable uh, backgrounds. With humans, there is no known malformation like this, so this is only a, uh, an example in experiments in mice. Another experiment was uh, that uh, they knocked out the A3 uh, gene, which was uh, responsible for the voice box, the larynx, thyroid, parathyroid, glans, thymus. If this was knocked out, then the little mice, they died because uh, they had uh, metabolic problems and they had uh, also problems uh, with uh, giving a voice. They couldn't squeak and the mother didn't care for them. If the HOXD3 gene was knocked out, then there was no atlanto-occipital joint. So in this case, when the, when the baby rat was lifted or mouse was lifted, then the, the weight of the head uh, did a transverse section in the spinal, uh, uh, spinal uh, cord and the mouse died. But if they re-implanted these genes instead of each other, then uh, both, in both cases, 
the uh, development was normal. So that shows that this, the genes in this paralogs group, groups may substitute each other if they get into the proper surrounding. So if the A gets into the D surrounding, that's the job of the D. If the D gets into the A surrounding, that's the job of the A. And thank you for your attention.